Okay, let's get started. So I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, Conjure Obia and Santeria Mythologies in Afro-Caribbean Modernism with Dr. Evans Lansing Smith, the chair of the Mythological Studies Department. So this presentation is going to be about 50 minutes and the last 10 minutes we'll have some opportunity for Q&A. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen if you want to type any of your questions. These questions will be directly related to this presentation. If you do have any admissions questions, feel free to email admissions at pacifica.edu. I'll type the information in the chat box below. And I will also paste the link to our free application. So because you are attending today, you get a free application to apply to Pacifica Graduate Institute. So we're going to get started in a minute, but I'd also like to share that if you haven't attended our Pacific Experience Day yet, I'd also definitely recommend you attend as we have breakout sessions for every program. And we also have a featured presentation and a student services panel. But again, you can always email admissions at pacifica.edu with any questions. All right, let's get started with the presentation. Okay. Um... Welcome everybody. I am Lance Smith, Chair of the Myth Program at Pacifica, which is an interdisciplinary program that addresses the various aspects of mythology as it plays itself out in religious studies and literature, art history, music, and philosophy, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, my particular background uh, is in comparative literature and mythology with a special interest in the uh, modernist uh, movement in the 20th century. And I want to address that in relationship to the Afro-Caribbean uh, form of modernism, focusing on a couple of spectacular artists with Fredo Lam and Romare Bearden. And when I say modernism, I'm talking really about the movement that started in about 1895 and then up through the, the First and Second World War. Um, and uh, in a lot of creative experimentation and major breakthroughs in, were involved in, in the arts and painting and music and so forth uh, during this period up to the Second World War. And then typically we refer to the period after the Second World War as postmodernism. And both of these will be involved in uh, today's presentation. Uh, both modernism and postmodernism are deeply engaged with myth. All of the great masterpieces of literary modernism, for example, uh, are engaged with myths in complicated ways, like James Joyce's Ulysses, uh, for example. And it became such a central theme in the modernist literature, the first part of the 20th century, that T.S. Eliot uh, wrote a little review of um, Joyce's Ulysses, in which he defined what he called the mythical method in his review of Ulysses. And it was essentially a, a sustained parallel between the details of domestic life and the present, and some undercurrent of symbolism derived from mythology. In Joyce's case, of course, Ulysses was uh, structured by references to Homer's Odyssey. And it presents us simultaneously with a very detailed portrait of daily life in Dublin, uh, June 16th, 1904. But with each chapter having uh, sustained parallels to episodes from Homer's Odyssey. And this is what Eliot called the mythical method. The critical consequence of the mythical method uh, for Eliot, which is relevant to our work today, is the notion that what the mythical method does is confer what Eliot called shape and significance on the anarchy and futility of contemporary history. Shape and significance on the anarchy and futility of contemporary history. And uh, he was writing just after World War I um, with World War II uh, around the corner. Uh, so he knew what, what, what was meant by anarchy and futility. And uh, it's not so very far from our current situation 
in many ways. So the quest for myth essentially is a quest for meaning, structure, and order, uh, not only in the artworks that we'll be looking at, but also as myth manifests itself uh, in, in, in our lives. The most important myth from uh, antiquity that the modernists all referred to, including Refredo Lamb and Romare Bearden, who will be talking about today, was the mythology of the descent to and return from the underworld, a, a myth that we call the Nekia, using a Homeric term for Book 11 of the Odyssey, referring to the descent to and return from the underworld. And uh, this is a myth that permeates all of the modernist movement in literature, the arts, uh, and so forth. So that's going to be our focus to see. Uh, I'm, I've not put the slides up yet. I'm doing the introduction at this point. Uh, that will be the focus of what we're going to do uh, today. Examine how does the myth of the Nakia inform the works of Afro-Caribbean modernism and what do they do with it that is so powerfully new uh, and, and original? So I'm going to proceed with the presentation well aware that there's more material here than one can absorb in 50 minutes. And I'll just have to see how far we, uh, we get. So at this point, I'd like to share my screen and begin the presentation. on Afro-Caribbean modernism. Uh, and I'm going to use a couple of terms that are critical for this. Uh, one of them is syncretism, which involves the synthesis or relationship between a variety of mythologies from different traditions and how that uh, changes in the work of Refredo Lamb and Romare Bearden uh, after the Second World War in a period of, of uh, post-colonialism, when the European powers, the imperial powers of France and Spain and England uh, withdraw from such places, uh, and the French, of course, included, uh, as the, uh, the Caribbean worlds um, uh, that were the location of these, uh, the, the lives of these artists. An essential aspect of post-colonialism is a recovery of the indigenous roots of the native populations of the Caribbean islands and uh, a circling back to the origins of those cultures, uh, which I call recorso, a return to indigenous roots. And that involves a discovery of these extraordinary mythologies of the Caribbean world associated with such movements as the, the voodoo in Haiti, uh, the Santeria uh, rituals in, in Cuba, and in Martinique, the encounter that Romare Bearden had with the Obia traditions. All of these involve explorations of the relationship between this world and the other, so to speak. The other conceived as the world of the ancestral dead, the world of the spirits, and so forth. Hence the connection to the mythologies of the Nakia. Here's Eliot's definition of the mythical method, which I just uh, recited for you. And a quick reminder that the hero journey is relevant to the subject of the descent to and return from the underworld as outlined by Joseph Campbell in this selection from his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. The journey to the underworld at the bottom of the circle and the subsequent return. And I'm particularly interested in our subject today in Afro-Caribbean modernism with that bold horizontal line, the threshold between the two worlds, because this becomes uh, one of the creative contributions to the myth that are uh, offered by our uh, artists and poets of the Afro-Caribbean Renaissance. And I've tried to indicate that shift uh, moving from the circle to this image of the explorations between this world and the other, moving in both directions 
with the liminal space or the threshold uh, in, in between them, if you think of those three uh, vertical lines as an image of a portal. And it's that particular liminal threshold between the two worlds with images emerging from the underworld, moving into this one and vice versa, that is the, the, the key uh, transformation of the myth in the works that we're going to be looking at. I'd also like to uh, remind you that the underworld is broadly uh, defined and there are many different ways of experiencing the journey to the underworld. Uh, most famously is the notion of an inferno from Dante that the underworld is a place of punishment uh, and pain. Uh, and this is certainly the case, uh, of course, during the 20th century with that particular approach to the underworld being extremely important given the history of the century. But it's also other things. The underworld is also a crypt, a place of the ancestral dead where one can communicate with the spirits of the dead through the rituals of Santeria, for example, and uh, voodoo in the, in, the, in the Haitian context. So also uh, the underworld is a very special place, which I call a temenos from the Greek, a sacred space of revelation and transformation. And this will be very important, uh, in particular for Rafaito Lamb and others. And then finally, the underworld as a source of the archetypal images of the collective unconscious, using the psychological metaphor that the underworld is in some way related to uh, the dynamics of the deep unconscious of the human psyche. When the mythology of the Nakia, the descent of the underworld is activated in a painting or a text, certain kinds of images typically appear. And I've uh, offered this very brief overview of a variety of different images that manifest when the mythology of the descent to the underworld occurs. And in our work today, this would include very importantly, zoomorphic necrotypes that I call them. The uh, horse is particularly important. Uh, certain kinds of places in the natural world, uh, very important. And then various images from the architectural domain. And I call these images necrogynotypes, combining the word nekia with archetype and the word uh, gynecology with uh, archetype. And all I mean by that fancy word are images of the descent to the underworld, which are activated in a text, often in a domain that is presided over by the divine feminine archetypal images of the feminine related to the mythology of the underworld. And this gives a kind of a basic background to the materials that we're going to be uh, talking about today. Now, uh, the project that I'm working on combines not only the paintings, but also the poetry of people like Aimé Césaire and uh, Derek Walcott, uh, although that is actually part of a larger course that I'm working on. We do have time today to get a little taste of this artistic movement in relationship to the mythologies of the Nakia, beginning with this marvelous collaboration of Alfredo Lamb on the right and the great uh, poet of negritude, uh, Aimé Césaire uh, on the left. And they uh, collaborate in uh, certain uh, major publications that I'd like to explore. And you have a musical uh, attachment there that we'd be able to explore in the classroom of uh, Aimé Césaire's poetry set to jazz. It's a terrific recording called Insurrection Perlier, a French recording uh, that is uh, really quite marvelous. Here is uh, Wilfredo Lamb uh, with his uh, some of his uh, collections as masks from uh, his art, his collection of African art. And in the background, you'll see a little glimpse of one of the paintings, the large canvases that we'll explore briefly uh, during the presentation today. 
Wilfredo Lam was born in Cuba. His father was Chinese. Uh, his mother was uh, indigenous with mixed uh, racial ancestry of the indigenous populations of Cuba and the uh, Spanish colonial uh, uh, lineage as well. So his, he, he kind of sums up the complexity of the Caribbean world with the multiple uh, racial inheritances uh, associated with them, uh, including of course, in a very important way, the connection to the African world which he began to explore in a very deep way in his collections and in his art. Now, our subject will focus on this critical moment in 1939, in the early 40s, uh, during the Second World War when the Nazis invaded Paris. And there was an extraordinary uh, uh, exile of artists who were hostile to the Nazi regime uh, leaving on a boat in Marseille in 1941. Uh, this was a, an endeavor sponsored in part by Peggy Guggenheim. And in this particular picture, you will see Wilfredo Lamb in the front with his wife. And behind him, you'll see uh, André Breton. And they're both uh, on, on their way back, back home, so to speak, for Wilfredo Lamb, stopping first in uh, Martinique and then eventually uh, Lamb making his way uh, back to Cuba. Now, the complication here for both Wilfredo Lamb and uh, uh, um, uh, Aimé Césaire is that the descent to the underworld gets conflated with the mythology of the homecoming of the hero from Homer's Odyssey. The homecoming uh, motif and myth we call the Nostoy. So for both Wilfredo Lamb and Aimé Césaire, going back home to Martinique and uh, going back home to Cuba was a shock to see the condition of a colonial population suffering from the long history of uh, slavery and co colonial exploitation in both Martinique and Cuba. And so in, in, in many ways, the Nostoy, the homecoming, was a descent into hell, a revelation of these uh, the tragic circumstances of the history of slavery uh, in the Caribbean world. Uh, on the middle uh, line here, you'll see something, uh, some of the details of what's meant by syncretic vitalism or the notion of syn syncretism as a mixture of different styles. And for Lamb, this essentially meant uh, a mixture of the cubist experimentation of Picasso, whom he met in Paris, along with the surrealist uh, movement related to people like Andre Breton and um, a, ho a host of others. And then finally, how they, that gets mixed into Lamb's paintings with reference to the traditions of uh, the Santeria uh, rituals that he experienced firsthand along with the rituals in voodoo uh, in Haiti. So it's that particular synthesis of mythologies that uh, Lamb draws from in his, in his works. Uh, here are uh, Lamb and Breton in Haiti in the 40s when they went together uh, to a, uh, a voodoo uh, ritual involving the trance possessions with the various uh, voodoo deities uh, associated with them. And Breton's a very important figure because after leaving Haiti, he went to the United States and, and he, he uh, had a trip in which he went uh, westwards into the territory of the Hopi. And he became very, very interested in the uh, Hopi Kachinas that you'll see on the wall here behind him. And he also wrote a wonderful book about his time uh, in uh, Martinique, spent in the company not only of, of Lamb, but also uh, Aimé Césaire. Uh, you can find this translated uh, in, in wonderful English uh, editions as well. Uh, this is uh, Lamb's uh, ancestor, uh, Matonia, Antonia Wilson, and she essentially 
uh, raised him as a boy, his grandmother. And he was uh, instructed or initiated by her uh, into the mysteries of Santeria, uh, sent, uh, rituals, and had some very specific um, uh, experiences and encounters that became important for his work. So that when he went back to Cuba, after his time in Europe, which involved uh, an experience of the uh, Spanish Civil War, and uh, which forced him to leave Spain. And then in Paris, the Nazis moved in. So he's coming out of an extraordinary tempestuous time of uh, appalling uh, violence and dislocation, uh, returning to his native land where he has to witness the continued impact of European colonialism on the indigenous populations of the island. And one of the first paintings that he did uh, coming out of that return uh, was called The Jungle, 1943. And here he is working on this extraordinarily large and uh, complex uh, artwork, which you'll see uh, in the background here. And even a, just a very, very quick look uh, with the horse and the woman uh, gives a sense of the impact of Picasso, uh, particularly Picasso's Guernica on, on Lamb's work. But he does something as extraordinarily new uh, and original uh, with it. So I'd like to take a look at this. And the uh, criticism is very helpful when you read the secondary literature on Lamb. And it makes a distinction between the word for jungle, the selva, resignified by Lamb as El Monte, uh, meaning a sacred forest clearing uh, in the undergrowth. And it's that sacred forest that is so important for Wifredo Lamb, the underworld as a temenos, as a crypt, a place where the ancestral spirits of the dead uh, communicate with the living, but also a place where historically the black slaves escaped the plantations and found refuge and a home in the so-called bush, La Maleza. So it's a, it's a complicated domain associated with the symbolism of the Cuban jungle and, and this uh, very, very dense and complicated uh, painting, which is characteristic of modernist art uh, in general, this kind of complication and density and the range of references to a variety of mythologies. Now, uh, so if you think about the imagery of the uh, Nakia, the journey to and return from the underworld, and that image I put of the permeable nature uh, with the underworld emerging uh, into this world and the boundaries the world's being uh, a transparent, you might say, so that the jungle spirits of the dead begin to manifest themselves just at that place where the jungle meets the you know, domestic uh, plantation territory. So here we'll see the images of the mythological deities and the spirits of the ancestral dead associated with the Cuban jungle uh, woven into this absolutely gorgeous, complicated, uh, painting, which is in fact uh, very carefully uh, composed. And some of the images that are uh, uh, make their way into this piece will be obsessive motifs in, in Lamb's work, uh, such as the a strange hybrid part human, part horse figure uh, on the left. And just to the right of that figure, the strange hybrid creature, part woman, part spirit, part bird, part fish. And then uh, on the right, a, a third uh, image with the smaller one in between, representing various symbols associated with Cuba and its history in relationship to the myth of the underworld and Nastoy. So that these, uh, the jungle here uh, is essentially composed of the sugar cane, 
the tall reeds that you'll see there, and the uh, tobacco leaves and the conflicting cultural associations with them. And the introduction of elements of, uh, of, of violence with the scissors in the upper right there that will become knives and indicate some of the painful uh, sinister dimensions of uh, Cuban history related to the colonial period and slavery with the enforced labor associated with sugarcane, uh, for example, uh, woven into the uh, this rather extraordinary image, along with little faces peeping out from the forest representing the deities uh, of the ancestral dead connected to the Afro-Caribbean mythologies that Lamb was so uh, interested in. So I've broken this up just a little bit to isolate the figures so you can read the image uh, and explore this at leisure uh, when you go back to it at home perhaps that uh, indicate and isolate the different figures associated with the composition emerging from and returning into uh, the depths of the underworld uh, of the jungle, which is uh, an inferno from the point of view of the exploitation of slave labor, but it's also a crypt in the sense of the domain of the ancestral dead. And it's also a temenos, a place where the ancestral deities manifest themselves when the boundary between the two worlds becomes permeable. Uh, the horse is of particular importance in relationship to the feminine throughout the course of Lamb's work. And these are endlessly uh, interesting images to explore. Now to give uh, just very quickly a sense of this uh, hybrid syncretism of the African diaspora and the way those symbolic images made their way into Lamb's work, uh, we could take a look at this quickly at this piece called The Eternal Present shortly after uh, the jungle. And again, it's a very complicated image and it's very, very difficult uh, to read uh, at first hand. It takes quite a bit of meditation and you'll see the strange uh, images of, uh, that, that emerge from the jungle with the uh, uh, kind of uh, combination of the human and the, uh, the horse and the bull and the monkey on the left. And then this little face on a plate in the lower right, uh, right beside a hand with a knife in it. And then in the upper right, our upper right, this hand holding a rather threatening looking staff with a double bladed ax pointed upwards and downwards. The criticism uh, would help us to identify the various deities from the uh, African traditions that were uh, on, on uh, Lamb's mind when he did this piece. And these are all to some extent uh, hypothetical identifications of the different images and presences that appear uh, in, in the painting. Uh, associated with the Afro-Caribbean uh, mythologies that Lamb was working with. And it's, it's the synthesis of those mythologies that is so important uh, uh, for Lamb's work. So it makes for a difficult read and complicated analysis, especially in a short presentation. Um, but you can see the little round head here uh, is identified with the messenger Hermes-like figure, guardian of the forest and the crossroads, and other uh, blacksmith, Ogun the warrior, and the knife and the thunder uh, bolt of Chango and so forth. All of that brought together in a kind of surrealistic style uh, is uh, very characteristic of, of Wilfredo Lamb's uh, achievement and his art. And this is a little doodle he did to identify the different Orishas uh, in the traditions of African mythology that he was bringing into his artwork. In class, we would explore these 
associations in more detail. In a short presentation, we can only take a quick look at some selected examples. And I've chosen to focus briefly on the symbolism of the horse in Lamb's work, which is related to the uh, rituals of the possession states in Santeria and Voodoo, where the deity is said to mount and ride the worshiper when they go into a trance and uh, manifest themselves through the form of the individual who's been possessed uh, by the deity. And the symbolism for that uh, is the horse. And Lamb's uh, work coming out of Picasso's clearly in an image like this, very, very typically connects the horse to the, to the archetypal images of the divine feminine. Uh, and in this particular case, you'll see a very complicated image with what appears to be a, a female body, apparently abstractly uh, uh, holding a child in the form of the Madonna, but these very, very strange and somewhat sinister presences with horse-like heads and flared nostrils with the hair of the mane uh, here and here, but also combined with very important symbols of the archetypal feminine, like the symbolism of the uh, crescent moon that you'll see up here as a part of her face. I'm sorry, this mouse is very sensitive. So there are a, a innumerable examples of what is called in Lamb's work, the femme cheval in French, the, the horsewoman. And uh, they combine these images of the horse with images of his uh, surrealistic approach to the deities of the Afro-Caribbean uh, world that he was deeply involved in. And these are just a few of those uh, of the femme cheval in his paintings that are extraordinarily complex, evocative, and as you can see, often very, very uh, much inspired by Picasso's uh, portraits. Now the horse is, is deeply archetypal and in a mythology class at Pacifica, we would explore the background of the symbolism of the horse in relationship to the journey to the under underworld and the symbolism of the great goddesses. This particular one is the white horse of Uffington in England. And uh, this one is a ceramic terracotta piece of the connection between the horse and the feminine in this uh, symbolism of uh, the Medusa from whose head uh, Pegasus is born. And you'll see this absolutely marvelous little Pegasus here that she's holding. So, and uh, the spirals here are meant to represent the serpentine uh, motif of the hair of the Medusa. And it's the connection of those images of the horse, the feminine and the serpent that uh, Lamb was so interested in and it has a, a long uh, archetypal background in the history of uh, uh, mythology, as for example, in this Roman piece of a horse goddess uh, called uh, Epona, uh, which was very, very uh, important in the European world when the Romans began to move northwards and encountered similar deities uh, connecting the feminine uh, very typically to the white mare it's very strong in Ireland, for example. Now, another uh, painting before we move forward to uh, Romare Bearden for a little bit is this, uh, uh, the image of called The Threshold by Refredo Lamb, which incorporates this rhomboid-like figures. There are three of them, uh, large ones with smaller rhomboids enclosed within them. So the geometrical motifs uh, are very, very important part uh, of, of the art of the time and of Lamb's work. And these have been seen as representing a portal or a threshold to the other world. And you can see the little spirits of the other world beginning to emerge here in the left and the bottom. And this is specifically related to a Naningo uh, tradition of the Abakua strains of African mythology 
in the Caribbean world with these uh, images of the spirits of the dead that form an important part of the dances. So it's quite possible that Lamb took uh, aspects of this iconography from that tradition, but also from the traditions of the Haitian voodoo with the so-called Veve corn paintings that are supposed to uh, activate the communication between the living and the dead. And they very typically involve this kind of geometrical symbolism. And in this case, the Veve has the uh, upward and downward pointed uh, triangles brought together in this rhomboid uh, shaped uh, portal to the spiritual world. And again, uh, this kind of geometrical symbolism has a long archetypal history related to the Nakia and the iconography of the great goddesses of the ancient world. Uh, this is from the island of Orkney in Scotland at a, at a special temple slash tomb site on one of the islands. And what you see inscribed in the rock are the same rhomboids with the triangles connected at the base that Lamb was using uh, in his uh, painting called The Threshold. And very famously, the geometrical symbolism here in an artifact from Crete associated with the Lady of the Labyrinth. And you'll notice on her apron, you will find the same complicated geometrical symbolism, upward and downward pointed triangles at the position of the womb, uh, representing the movement back and forth between the world of the spirit into the world of the flesh at birth and the contrary movement from the flesh to the spirit at death, both presided over by the divine feminine. And in this case, she's got the symbolism of the snakes in her hand and perhaps a feline symbol uh, of the cat on her head. And this makes its way into the complicated geometrical iconography of Hermeticism and alchemy, uh, which is another uh, class that I teach in the curriculum. Uh, here you'll see a very complicated uh, image of two uh, interlocking triangles inscribed within each other from uh, Giordano Bruno in the 16th uh, century. So these uh, uh, traditions of uh, Santeria and voodoo and the iconographies associated with them become of central importance in Lamb's work. What I would like to do now, given I've only got five or 10 minutes left, is to very quickly uh, show some images of the collaboration between Refredo Lamb and Aimé Césaire, uh, beginning in the 60s and then continuing up to the end of Lamb's life. And you can see here the strange, otherworldly, sinister synthesis of these uh, images from Afro-Cuban mythology, uh, which are haunting and disturbing and uh, certainly reflect the traumatic history of the indigenous populations of the Caribbean that Lamb was uh, so much uh, involved with. And there are a handful of these images that uh, are accompanied by poetry uh, by Aimé Césaire. And you can see that dark, sinister, threatening, infernal uh, side of the underworld. But you'll see also the continued interest in the symbolism of the horse, the feminine, the bull, the moon, and so forth as being a very important part of the iconography of these enigmatic, complicated, uh, sometimes sinister images. We have now just a few minutes to race forward to Romare Bearden, who was American growing up in North Carolina and coming into uh, his artistic uh, uh, period uh, in the New York of the 1940s. So he's a younger uh, artist, but like uh, Rafael Lamb, became very, very interested in African and Cuban mythologies. Here is Romare Bearden with Aimé Césaire. Here he is with Derek Walcott, whose poetry would be an important part of a full class devoted to this subject. 
And just to get some sense of Bearden's development, uh, this piece from the 1960s called The Walls of Jericho gives some sense of the incredible turbulence and violence and pain and suffering of the civil rights movement and the whole problem that we're facing today with this horrible uh, legacy of really bad karma for, for the nation. And uh, during that period of apocalyptic disintegration, the Vietnam War, the assassinations, the civil rights movements, the murder of the children in the churches, uh, horrific atrocities that are uh, so shameful part of our history. Uh, this is uh, Romare Bearden's response. And it includes images of a collapsing civilization with the Gothic and the Roman, right? Uh, architecture on either side. And then in the middle, the incorporation of these extraordinary uh, sculptural artifacts from Africa that Lamb was so, uh, Bearden became very, very interested in. And the uh, complicated identification of these images from the walls of Jericho take us back to the rituals of the Yoruba people with the building of altars by the kings, the obas, where the worship, where the ancestral dead would be invoked, uh, and the the heads that we saw in those in the uh, previous images, we go back to that tradition of the summoning of the shades of the ancestral dead through ritual offerings. So Bearden is like Lamb, going back to his deepest roots with the African traditions that he became fascinated by in his time in New York, which of course has extraordinary resources for these artistic traditions. When he uh, moved and when he became such a very successful artist, he bought a home in Martinique and he turned his attention to an old theme in his associated with what he called the conjure women from his time in the American South. And the, uh, the conjure women were um, kind of shamans that presided over uh, medicinal uh, work uh, and spiritual communications with the dead and um, psychological counseling, or all kinds of functions. And you'll see here is uh, extraordinary painting of the uh, conjure woman uh, focusing, uh, hearkening back to his time in North Carolina. And, and again, some of the great symbols such as the symbol of the bull connected to the conjure woman, which is uh, inspired by this image from a bull in the highlands that he saw photograph. And the bull is one of those great symbols that Joseph Campbell explores in his books of the time. Uh, the, the Mask of God series that Bearden was very, very interested in. Uh, as they were published in the 1960s. And in those books, Campbell talks about the bull and as the consort of the great goddess. And uh, all of that goes back a long, long way to Mesopotamia, as for example, in this bull from a Sumerian burial site uh, near the city of Ur, the Royal Cemetery, and the island of Crete. So that these images have deep archetypal mythological roots that uh, go way back. And Lamb's work is gorgeous. Uh, I'm sorry, Romare Bearden's uh, uh, application of these symbols of the conjure woman as an angel uh, with the symbolisms of the snake and the bull and the bird and so forth are really spectacular um, examples of, of uh, post-war American art. And here's one of the conjure women in the Caribbean context. And she's on the lower right here, she's initiating a young girl, preparing her for marriage in this rather distressing and brutal uh, opening of the hymen uh, that you'll see in progress here. So many of these images will incorporate that kind of sinister violence but here in an atmosphere of Edenic paradise that our uh, Romare Bearden found when he moved to uh, Martinique. 
and saw all these rituals. Uh, and here's our territory here in the Caribbean. And I have time maybe to look at just a couple of images here before we stop for questions. Uh, when uh, Romero Bearden encountered the Obia, he turned to watercolor as his preferred medium. And watercolor is the perfect uh, medium to embrace this transparent liminality uh, between the two worlds with these figures that are both emerging from the nebulous world of the spirit and then receding into them. And they're right in that space in between during the transpossession rituals that occur uh, in the Obia world. And his portraits of these Obia uh, women uh, are extraordinarily beautiful watercolors, but they also incorporate some of these basic, um, what I call necrogynotypes. Uh, particularly important for Bearden was the image of the serpent that emerges, but also the imagery of the bull comes back in this high priestess of the Obia in the very, very powerful watercolor of uh, the priestess of the spiritual traditions of the Afro-Caribbean world that Bearden was able to experience while he was in Martinique. And this one clearly indicates the powerful presence of the serpent as a central symbol in this tradition. And uh, once again, this is a key theme in Campbell's uh, book, The uh, Occidental Mythology from the Masks of God. And I think I'll finish just quickly with these synchronicities that occurred uh, when uh, he was working on these paintings. And, uh, and they have to do uh, with these weird synchronicities when uh, he was doing these. And in one case, a big anaconda crawled out of a basket at a time when Bearden went to visit one of the Obia women. And then another time in his studio, he invited a woman to spend the night in the studio and uh, an eight foot long python came out of her suitcase and coiled around the easel while, while he was painting. So that's the kind of weird transition liminality between one world and the next that is uh, involved in what I call uh, the imagery of the Afro-Caribbean modernism and its connection to the mythologies of the Nakia and the Nostoy. Uh, although I have many more images here, we only have 10 minutes left. So if you want to hear the rest of the lecture, you have to, you have to communicate with Jessica and explore the possibilities of coming on board uh, to the MYTH program when we have more time to work with this material. So I'm sorry for the rush. Uh, I think probably what uh, Jessica can do is I will send her the whole, the whole PowerPoint and so you'd be able to explore these images at, at your leisure and then come with questions. I can definitely do that. Um, in addition, I'll send the recording of this webinar and I can send the full presentation as well. So there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you ha have any questions, you can feel free to ask Dr. Lansing Smith. And before we get into the q and I'd also like to introduce the admissions advisor for the Mythological Studies Program, Danny Valdez. So, you're just gonna- Danny, Danny's the one that, we, that you communicate with. He's doing a spectacular job for the Myth Program and for the rest of the institution the really hard work of finding the great students that we get to come into our programs. Thank you, Lance, I appreciate that. Um, so my name is Daniel Valdez, I'm the advisor. I'm gonna, or maybe, I don't know if I have access to, but yeah, in the chat, I'll go ahead and put my contact info. And if you have uh, any additional questions that we can't answer now, feel free to reach out uh, anytime. Thanks, Danny. Danny. And I'll also put Danny's email in the chat. Uh, it's good for you to put the face to the name so that um, if he gives you a call, you know who's giving you a call. <laughs> All right, so let's start with the Q&A. 
Um, our first question is, how does mythology inform psychotherapy in session? Uh, most typically, uh, since Pacifica is largely inspired by the depth psychologic, psychological traditions of Freud and Jung, and then the post-Jungian post world of James Hillman, the mythological images uh, manifest themselves quite frequently and quite dramatically uh, in the form of dreams. If not dream, uh, reverie, uh, artistic creations, uh, in which the archetypal images of the deep unconscious manifest themselves in ways that become accessible to the uh, analytical work during a session. So for, for Jung, for example, Jung's myth of analysis was the descent to and return from the underworld. Thinking of the underworld as the domain of the collective unconscious that manifests itself in the form of the dreams. So that's the way you would work with it very uh, directly with the images that emerge uh, in the psyche of the individual who comes into the analytical hour. Okay, thank you. And our second question is about Romare Bearden's origins. Yeah, he was very his uh, he was very pale skin, but he was of uh, uh, he was black. He was uh, from a black family in, in uh, North Carolina. I don't know much more about his ancestry beyond beyond that. Uh, I don't believe that either his father or his mother were uh, Caucasian. It's not, of course, an, out of the question that uh, one of the one of the other, the grandparents' side, might have been. Yes, uh, some other uh, questions are coming up. I'm not sure I'm understanding them. No, okay, necrogynotyping images merged science fiction and fantasy literature and film all the way through it. Uh, the, um, the great tradition of myth and film and the way these images manifest themselves in the work of the great modernist filmmakers, Jean Cocteau, Fellini, Bergman, Antonioni, Truffaut, uh, all of that you can pick up and follow into American film and TV and TV series, science fiction, uh, Tolkien, for example, The Lord of the Rings are, are, are permeated by the uh, images uh, of mythology in, in really, really important ways. The film that Romeo Bearden and uh, Refredo Lamb liked so much was the, the, the wonderful film, Black Orpheus by Michel Carnet that was such a smash hit during the 60s because it has this great scene of a Macumba ritual uh, in, in, uh, in, in Rio uh, during the carnival. And uh, that would be a good place to turn now for a revisioning of the mythology of Orpheus in that film. Perhaps while we wait for our last one or two questions, um, maybe while we have Danny here, do you want to share any um, information you have on applying? Any tips? Um, well, I guess the main thing, one question that comes up is what the deadline is. So the deadline to submit all your application requirements would be July 31st, because we want to have enough time to uh, have everybody get um, you know, to orientation, get their student access, registration for class, which usually takes place about six to seven weeks before the class starts, which in this case, uh, the fall quarter will begin um, September 24th. Um, so there'll be plenty of time and we don't wanna rush anybody in uh, at the very last second and have them start as if they're already behind. Uh, but other than that, uh, specific questions about application requirements, uh, just in the interest of time, I would just say you, the best thing to do is just email me directly and then we can arrange time to talk or email whatever the form of communication is best for you and 
I'm happy to assist anyway. Uh, Jessica, I am seeing a question that I like very much. Um, it's Karen Bar Barranco, uh, references to music and dance. I, I just mentioned the great film by Michel Carnet, uh, Black Orpheus, and it, the, the, the dance goes all through it, you know, with, with uh, the wonderful carnival in Rio. But Romare Bearden has a really beautiful painting called The Carnival Begins. And it gives you a good, vivid, artistic image of uh, the importance of music and dance and the um, in the ritual events in the Caribbean that he saw. And it's a, it's a really a great, great subject to work with the musical traditions and the dance, of course. So thank you for that question. Okay, I think uh, Jessica had asked me very quickly, we get applications from people from all kinds of backgrounds that really love the MIT program. And not only, uh, you know, therapists and counselors, but creative artists, poets, musicians, filmmakers, and uh, naturally people who are involved in teaching in, the, uh, in a humanities liberal arts kind of curriculum that would embrace backgrounds in comparative literature, comparative religion, art history, music history, those foundational courses that you took in college, you know, related to art history and literature and the writing classes in the humanities, uh, all of those are excellent preparation. But I get students or, you know, any level of engagement with those uh, curriculums. Great, thank you. Yes, we do accept applicants from all backgrounds. And just a reminder, because you attended this webinar today, you are able to apply for free. So the link to apply is in the chat and you can also go directly to our website. Um, I am also seeing a couple questions about our COVID policies. So currently our classes are offered completely online, but once we're able to return to campus, we will be returning to our usual residential schedule where we offer um, classes on campus. You can view our academic calendar online and we're still waiting for the exact date about when we will be returning to campus. And we do have international students as well that um, attend Pacifica. So I saw a question about that. Um, it would be the same with international students. Currently our classes are online, but we are returning to on-campus classes. We may have an updated policy for international students because of code restrictions. So just stay tuned for that. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Again, I'll be sending out the recording and the presentation to all attendees in the next week or so. Thank you so much to Dr. Lance Smith for your presentation. And thank you, Danny, for attending. And we hope to hear from you soon.